Well, while everybody's still awake, um, I'll tell you that I am not a climatologist, never took a course in climate. Uh, I'm not a statistician. I'm a physicist. So um, I'm going to talk about the science. And wouldn't it be nice if the IPCC would follow the science? And I'm going to show you something that's very, very revealing. OK, <clears throat> I'll show this graph right here. I'm going to do a lot with this chart right here that came from the fifth assessment report. They've not published the graph for the sixth yet. Uh, just point out that there's a graph showing uh, heat going around the Earth, out to atmosphere, down from the sun, and so forth. But the only important message right there is, well, two messages. One, it looks pretty complicated. And the other is that all of those numbers refer to watts per square meter. That's thermal watts, of course, not electrical watts. And I'm going to discuss three clarifying facts. I'm going to discuss them in the context of that particular graph. Uh, now, I'm not the kind of person that likes to get into the brambles, so I'm going to be discussing things that are happening on a macroscopic scale. So I'm going to apply those three facts to, the, to that particular graph. Now, there's a whole bunch of internal processes that are of academic interest. You, it's like um, uh, chasing the heat around. Where does the heat go from feather to feather in your pillow? Um, and that has some academic interest, but it's of no interest to us here, uh, just only some kind of broad result. Fact number one, the heat coming in from the sun equals the heat being radi radiated to outer space. Now, just to give you an idea, if you're off by, uh, by a little bit so that the Earth warms up by a thousandth of a degree in a year, in a million years, which is zip on the cosmic time scale, you've warmed up by a thousand degrees. Now, it turns out that there is a little bit of imbalance, but we're not, that's a trivial amount. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. The second one, <clears throat> and this is something that the IPCC pays no attention to, and that is that the infrared irradiated from the surface depends on the surface temperature. When the uh, rent -a cop points that little gun thing at your head to measure your temperature, he's reading the IR from your, from your forehead. It follows a formula, okay? Now that formula happens to be that the intensity is Stefan Boltzmann radiation constant multiplied by the fourth power of the absolute temperature, but your job, should you decide to accept it, is to realize that there is a formula and it is correct. Okay, that's all you gotta know. Fact number three, the greenhouse effect is the difference between those two numbers. The first IPCC report came out in 1990. The sixth has come out in 2021. It is the first to recognize that difference. It is the first to recognize the name Stefan Boltzmann. Trust me, look it up. Oh, you don't trust me, go look it up. Go search, search through all those things, look for Stefan Boltzmann and see if you can find it. Okay, <clears throat> in simple equations, now it, when I taught physics, the whole idea was do the physics first, then do the math. So I'm going to do the physics first. The greenhouse effect is the difference between the surface emission and the IR to space. The greenhouse effect is therefore the surface emission minus the absorbed solar because the absorbed solar equals the IR to space. And the third, <coughs> excuse me, Third version of that is it's the surface emission minus the uh, 
sunlight averaged over the surface times one minus the albedo, the al being, albedo being the reflectivity. So we can write that as one equation. G equals sigma t to the fourth, that's the emission from the surface, minus the solar intensity divided by four, that's a matter of converting pi r squared into four pi r squared, times one minus alpha, alpha being the albedo. Now, I want you to commit that to memory. <laughs> Write it down. It's, it has four variables, the greenhouse effect, the surface temperature, the solar intensity, and the albedo. That takes care of all of the IR, right there. It's a constraining equation. It always holds at equilibrium, no exceptions. That is why it's important. Think of it as an electric fence for climate realities. There's a lot of things that can go on, but you must balance that equation. Of course, the imaginary models from the IPCC, being imaginary, don't feel the effect of the electric fence, and they get through. So with the greenhouse effect, suppose we have an increased greenhouse effect because CO2 rises, for example. If the greenhouse effect increases, then the surface emission must increase equally, providing that the albedo and the solar intensity remain constant. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something about the IPCC. They confuse the surface with the planet. What they say is a warmer planet radiates more energy to space. And I'm going to show you how, in two cases, that is wrong. First, we're going to compare the Earth with no greenhouse gases, which is something that they do. It would have the same albedo, according to this hypothetical calculation. It would radiate 239 watts per square meter to space. The present Earth at the surface is 289K, and it radiates 239 watts per square meter to space. Case number two, comparing two planets, Earth and Venus. We have a surface temperature of 289K, and we radiate 239 watts per square meter to space. Venus has a lead melting temperature of 737K, and it radiates only 156 watts per square meter to space. Venus has a very high albedo. It reflects a whole lot of sunlight. It's in a more intense solar field, but it reflects a heck of a lot more, and therefore it radiates less than we do. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to take this formula as if it were God's certain truth. Um, for CO2 doubling, the radiative forcing is 3.7 watts per square meter. Now, uh, Will Happer, being a hell of a lot smarter than those guys, would argue that it, that number is an overestimate, but I'm going to use IPCC numbers. Think of this as intellectual jujitsu. We are going to use their arguments against them. So what is radiative forcing? It is an increment to the greenhouse effect. It's an increase in the net IR absorption, in the net IR blockage, or the net IR reduction, but it's an increase in G. Now you see, way back when, when you were doing algebra, X was different from Y, right? Here they're using delta F for the radiative forcing, and they're using capital G for the greenhouse effect, when the radiative forcing is nothing more than a change in G. Okay? Necessarily, delta F is delta G or DG, if you like calculus. It's an incremental change in G. The present greenhouse effect is, is uh, the difference between the, that radiated from the surface, which is 398, and the radiation to, to space, which is 239, so it winds up being at 159 watts per square meter. 
The radiative forcing due to doubling is 3.7. It is a mere 2.3% nudge with a dramatic name. Okay, here's the IPCC view. We have increased CO2, we have more forcing which causes global warming, more radiation back to the surface, that's at 342 watts per square meter coming back. What does the IPCC overlook? This is very important. They are forgetting about the emission from the surface and this means that they do not understand the constraining equation. Now, that looked like a complicated formula, but we can look at changes, and that turns out to be just to follow a simple graph. This graph is a graph of the increased surface radiation plotted vertically versus the increased temperature plotted horizontally. Okay? So, if the surface temperature would rise by 0.67 C, then the surface would, weigh, excuse me, would radiate 3.7 watts per square meter more than it does now. You might recognize that number. Okay, IPCC says that the most likely temperature rise from doubling CO2 would be three degrees. And that would imply an extra, or a total of 16.5 watts per square meter radiated from the surface. Now, I had a thought, and I didn't um, include it in this chart, but I'll just mention it. During the transition from the last glacial period to the present interglacial, took about 10,000 years to go from 18,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago. The temperature rose about seven degrees and the CO2 did a little bit more than double. So the CO2 uh, forcing due to that was somewhere around four watts per square meter. The increased radiation from the surface is 55 watts per square meter. Okay, but that's an aside. Now here's the future with doubled CO2. CO2 doubling adds 3.7 watts per square meter of forcing, which the IPCC says will raise our temperature three degrees well, three degrees goes from 289 to 292, and therefore it would now irradiate, it would send out 414 and a half instead of 398 watts per square meter. And the other greenhouse gases must absorb an additional 12.8 watts per square meter. You ever heard of gain of function? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So the IPCC models do have an inherent self-contradiction or a death spiral. Uh, 3.7 results in a temperature rise of three degrees, say the models. Surface now radiates 16 and a half watts per square meter more than it used to. The other GHGs absorb 12.8. Uh, now what? Another view, okay, now here's another possible explanation. The incoming sunlight and the radiation from the Earth as a whole are equal. They're not necessarily 239 watts per square meter. They are now, but they could be something else. They could be 250. They could be 317.842, but they have to be equal. If the sunlight increases or the albedo decreases, those numbers will change, but equally. And lower albedo means the GHGs, the greenhouse gases, 
don't have to absorb that whole thing. However, the IPCC blames everything on greenhouse gases, but 80% on CO2. And they say that the albedo increases, which makes it, which puts a bigger burden on all these other greenhouse gases to absorb that radiation. It just ain't going to happen. There it is. There's a picture there. I've picked out some of the scenarios that they have, but they're, they're, they're all identical in this respect. That, okay, the, the left-hand uh, column there is the total uh, temperature rise. Uh, this is 2081 to 2100 relative to 1850 to 1900. The second column there is CO2. The third column is the uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gases. And the fourth column going down is the albedo. Now that goes down because the albedo goes up, okay? Because they're talking about the change in temperature. They're talking about a cooling effect there. So the IPCC, being a bunch of very intelligent people, is considering two possible ways out of this conundrum. Here's the first. It's called the modern math solution. Three point seven equals sixteen and a half for very large values of three point seven. <laughs> and the other one is the headline grabbing solution, which you mean, oh, we got four X amplification. Disaster. Send money. Now, let me show you what a four X amplification does. Um, a milliwatt per square meter from any source whatsoever begets four milliwatts per square meter. Now, the IPCC would tell you that the CO2 is causing some things like uh, melting of permafrost. Uh, you can take all the CO2 in the world and it will not melt permafrost. What melts permafrost is heat. So what they're re what, what's really happening is that heat begets heat. One milliwatt gets you four. Four gets you 16. 16 gets you 64, which gets you 256, which gives you t uh, two to the 10th, which gives you two to the 14th, and so forth. Ad infinitum. And that explains why we're not here. You understand? It, what we're talking about is 400% interest compounded. Yes, follow the science and wouldn't it be nice if they did, but they ignore the inconvenient science. This baked in Physics-defying nonsense is the pillar of modern climate models. It is a source of terabytes of climate horror stories flooding the news media, worse yet, leading science journals. It is embarrassing to see stuff in physics journals that accept that nonsense. You can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time. And that's enough to set up a multi-billion dollar climate crisis industry. And with that, I thank you. And thank you.